I'm gonna. Do you want me to read your bio? Uh, sure? Well, uh, that always makes me feel like uh, awkward and look at my feet, so it's really up to you. Okay, well, I, I can live without the bio, for sure. Well, <laughs> just to be sure. So, Catherine is the <laughs> dean and professor at the Peter A. Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia. So, she's coming to visit you uh, from Vancouver. She's a fellow of the Trudeau Foundation and an internationally recognized expert in immigration law. So in addition to being the author of several books on the topic, including The New Politics of Immigration and the End of Settler Society, which was published at Cambridge University Press in 2016, she also conduct and has conducted research on refugee law and human rights, especially in the Canadian and the U.S. context. So you look at your book, so... <laughs> Thank you so much, Nathay, and I really want to... Uh, to thank Mireille in particular for the invitation uh, to come today and also to thank all those participants that she uh, talked into reading the book and spending two days talking about it. It really is an extraordinary uh, privilege to come into contact with your readers and to see what happens to your text when you send it out there in the world mm -hmm. and how, how people react to it and how things that you thought were perfectly clear when you wrote them down are traveling in a different direction now, or other things that you thought nobody would notice in the book suddenly become the, the centerpiece of the conversation. And mostly, it's uh, it's just tremendously gratifying uh, that's, that so many people have spent so much time uh, thinking so hard about this. That is, um, increasingly, uh, in an academic career, it's just so delightful. And, and uh, I can't remember, you know, at, at the beginning, 20 years ago, I was just so grateful ever to get anything published. And now that I just feel thrilled when people actually read it and it comes back to me in whatever form. And this form is particularly delightful. And um, it's, uh, you know, flattering and challenging. And the first day has been really intellectually engaging. And so thank you, Mireille, and everyone. Um, I'm a little bit anxious because I have been promised as being just as entertaining and invigorating as coffee, and I'm not, uh, you know, by, by mid-afternoon, I'm not sure that I can live up to that promise, although I am well caffeinated myself. Um, and what I'm hoping to do is talk for uh, maybe 40 minutes. I don't want to belabor it too much and then uh, spend any additional time that you would like to spend with me um, having a conversation with people who've read the book or might read the book or, or uh, about anything at all, really. Um, and, and there are no slides, so just enjoy this picture, which I did not choose, but which... Uh, you know, looks quite a lot like Vancouver, uh, like like the, um, there's a view like this out the window of my office at the University of British Columbia, in case you were not thinking of coming to UBC, this is my little pitch for, uh, for the advertisement. So I want to reflect on some of my key ideas in the new politics of immigration and to consider how events of the past two years partially confirm and partially challenge things that I understood at the time. So. Um, uh, of course, when the book comes out in 2016, that means it's mostly finished in, in 2015. And, uh, and so, at, in some sense, it's been a while, and um, a lot of things, as Mere said, have in fact happened. So, after doing that, I want to come back to the concluding moments of the book and consider whether there are any possibilities for optimism for improving contemporary immigration politics and how we might reach for those moments of optimism and attempt to make the most of them. So the fulcrum of the book is that the idea of a settler society as an interpreter or a predictor of immigration policy and politics has come to an end. So we still might use the term accurately and appropriately to categorize different states or nations or countries, um, but the long era in which settler societies had different approaches to immigration than the old world countries, we might say, of Europe, has ended. And we can't go back to that time. And over the course of today's conversation, I realize that it's really the idea that we can't go back that needs uh, some bolstering up at this point. And I hope to in get a little bit into that bolstering encounter uh, this afternoon. So this shift in what we can and can't do in our immigration politics is particularly important for the paradigmatic settler states that are founded on immigration, 
in cases where the settler encounter with Indigenous peoples has been so totalizing that the post-World War II era of decolonization passed those states by. So whereas in Africa and Asia there were movements in the 50s and 60s and formal decolonization, that hasn't happened for these paradigmatic nations of immigration, Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. And so in essence, these states are still very much operating in a colonial mode, something that the majority publics in, these, in Canada and other states are very, very slowly beginning to grasp. And there's something very significant um, happening in Canada where I think um, we are not at the forefront of this understanding. I would, I, I would, among these four exemplar states that I've been talking about, definitely put um, New Zealand in that forefront position. I think the encounter between settlers and Maori is in a very different place. But I think that Canada in the last, um, last decade, uh, possibly since um, the, what happened around the Meech Lake Accord, I think there is a change happening in Canada that has been really bolstered by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But I think that we are not yet, um, and Yasmina Boulevard, who joined us by Skype and so isn't in the room uh, this afternoon, talked about that this morning and talked about um, this very fledgling moment where we might begin to talk about Indigenous politics and, um, and immigration politics in the same breath or the same analytic frame. But gosh, it's difficult to do. So. The, the thesis about settler states is that we have not, or about these four particular settler states, is that because of the particular place and role and just volume of immigration and actually um, colonial success in decimating indigenous populations, we haven't decolonized. Um, but we are moving beyond a, a settler framework in terms of how we understand immigration. So understanding that immigration, um, that in immigration terms, the settler era is over, is vital for understanding how immigration politics now work in these states. And it's also useful for understanding how immigration politics work in other states, particularly prosperous Western liberal democracies in Europe, which were once nations whose members led the successive waves of immigration that made the settler society label meaningful. So, a central question here is why would this matter? Why bother challenging what is essentially our immigration mythology? What does this kind of challenge offer aside from quite a lot of pessimism? I realized that I was probably the most pessimistic person in the room for much of, of the day today. Um, so what can we get from this kind of a challenge aside from pessimism about the future and some clever rhetoric? Well. The answer to the question is the reason for writing the book. Immigration politics are deeply resistant to change. And change is desperately needed. Almost more desperately with each passing week. This was one of the um, days where I didn't read the newspaper in the morning. I was reading uh, papers for this afternoon's panel, which was undoubtedly um, uh, more optimistic and more interesting. But one feels when you work in this area that if you haven't read this morning's headlines, you may have missed um, some important immigration event that is going to be the thing everybody's talking about all day long. So in the question period, you can raise your hand and tell me what it was that was on the front page this morning. So on every side of current immigration politics, settler society mythology persists. And by this, I mean, by this kind of mythological frame, I mean a background, a backgrounded vision of hardworking immigrants who come to a new place, who set down roots, rebuild their lives to make better lives for their children, and to, at their core, contribute to their new country at great personal cost and thus contribute to new national identity. So that's our, our background that comes from the settler society stories and the nation building era of these countries. So for everybody who advocates on behalf of immigrants and refugees, this mythology is a powerful call to what is best about our past approaches to immigration. We conjure this mythology in order to persuade policymakers, judges, politicians, that we ought to return to a time when immigrants were treated differently because of the value that they brought to our nations. And in this, the refrain, we are all immigrants, which, which is, of course, a refrain that is silencing to Indigenous voices. 
um, this refrain gets repeated. And it's a very compelling story. And advocates would be loath and probably foolish to abandon it. So that's one of the forces that prop up this mythology. On the other hand, for those who seek to impose ever harsher immigration laws, ever more rigid restrictions, to build ever higher walls, this older mythology of the settler society provides a measure against which today's new immigrants are failing. Whether the story is that new immigrants refuse to integrate, or that they are so wealthy as to distort our real estate markets, or that they are not economically successful like their four, their, I want to say four parents, how do you make that gender neutral, the people, the generations of immigrants who came before them, or that qualified doctors and engineers are now Uber drivers, the story is the same in each of these small instances. They are not living up to the immigration imaginary of the past. In this version, the settler society mythology provides the justification for meaner policy measures because it demonstrates that what we're currently doing is somehow not working. And it also places the blame on those individuals and obscures the fact that the results that policymakers or politicians or publics currently complain of are an entirely predictable outcome of the ways that Western liberal democracies have changed their immigration politics. When we reach this point of undercutting the values of both settlement and society, and we change our immigration frameworks to recruit different types of people, it's not surprising that they do different things on arrival, and certainly not surprising that there's less um, compulsion to integrate in a particular way. So there is, because there's no incentive anywhere to move away from the old story, we lose the opportunity to notice key changes, to actually see and take account of the new politics of immigration, and thus to begin a process of trying to change them. My project in the book is to expose how and why this new politics has emerged, and to demonstrate that it's not simply a passing fad or a partisan moment or a cyclical swing, and to begin, possibly, to consider what we might be able to do about that. So today I've been hearing people um, all day respond in, in different ways, and I want to um, uh, take up some examples and, uh, and try to uh, get away from the text and talk a little bit about things we were discussing earlier today. I'm just, just challenging myself to see if I can do that, but I get to stand up and, and do it, have the coffee, as I mentioned, so it should be all right. Okay, so what's new? Well, a lot has happened since this book went to press, and in a way I'm glad of that, because I asserted at the time that the new politics were characterized by intensity, urgency, and legality, and certainly urgency is an easy case to make. It's possible to pick up a newspaper in any western state in a given week, you might not even week, need a week, you could use just a couple of days of this month, and read inches high headlines about immigration questions. Um, and so in this two, almost two and a half years since the book came out, gives me a huge range of things uh, to choose from. And I want to pick three or maybe um, maybe three and a half examples uh, to talk about um, in the next few minutes. So the first thing that I want to talk about is Brexit. Um, and uh, one, of the, the, one of the themes in the book is that immigration politics tends to be dominated by two kinds of, of discourses which operate as a flip side to one another. A discourse about economics and, um, and how we value migrants and how that value proposition has really been reduced to solely an economic proposition. And the, uh, um, the flip side of that coin is a human rights discourse in which we um, talk about, when, on, on, from an advocacy point of view, the human rights of migrants and how we need to somehow, well, it could be anything, we need to enhance those rights or we need to make more rights or we need to enforce rights differently, but somehow rights is the answer to the question and the thing, the tool, with which you would counter the economic imperative that is often driven in policy making. So inside this um, recounting of of how we might understand the immigration imperative behind Brexit, we find a little bit of this flip side, which is a tension between 
an economic-based analysis and a human rights-based analysis. So it's fair to say that looking back at the text that I published early in 2016, that the possibility of the UK voting to leave the EU was nowhere within my contemplation. And that's just like a horrifying confession to make because it puts me in that group of UK voters who were so urban-based, so highly educated, so globally oriented themselves that they just really didn't think that um, the population in Britain would ever vote to leave the EU. And I have to say that of of course, at the time that I was writing the book, the campaigns about this referendum were on, and, and people in courses, uh, you know, political science courses all through the, the UK, my daughter was in one of these classes, were studying in, in, uh, uh, in great detail what's going to happen with the referendum, and I just didn't bother to think about it. Okay. I was so certain that I knew what the outcome would be, and I was so completely wrong. And so the book talks about things happening in Europe as about moving to pan-Europe immigration law, about um, European citizenship as an immigration category, about Europe carving out a space for itself as an empire of human rights. Um, and I just really didn't think, and the UK will leave, and what will I say then? So at one level it just has to be said that mm, Brexit is kind of a counter to everything that I was writing about. On the other hand, however, I do think that an immigration story is at, is at the core, a chief explanation of the vote to leave the European Union. And that one of the things that ordinary Britons in the street in the days, both leading up to the vote and after it, were reporting was that they wanted the borders closed. And those interviews uh, and sound bites on television, which I looked at again, uh, about six months ago doing a different project, are really not, there's nobody there saying, I really want the borders of the UK close to French cheese. Or I really want the borders of the UK close to Italian wine. Get that Pinot Grigio out of here. You know, that is really not what's going on there. It is really about saying, we don't want those foreign people coming into the UK. And we want the borders closed to people. And as the negotiations, um, that the divorce agreement with uh, the EU progresses, we see that there's really a focus on please, please, somehow can we retain trade? Almost as much trade, nearly as much trade. We want trade just the same, but please just get rid of the people. And so one of the things that, um, one of the things that the Brexit story does is it makes immigration visible again. So people within the EU, because of the free movement over borders, EU nationals within the UK had disappeared from immigration statistics. And the data about who was immigrating to the UK and even who was studying in the UK became submerged. And if you looked just at immigra immigration, um, the story of, of um, like the four tiers that we were talking about, five tiers that we were talking about, um, about half an hour, 45 minutes ago, were really invisible in this story um, uh, of what was happening with, or, or really were overshadowed in terms of volume by people within the EU moving into the UK at that time. And what Brexit does is it makes immigration or movement across European borders really highly visible again and salient. It's possible, but I, have, I would have to test this, that there's even a part of the Brexit reaction that is uh, that demonstrates a real devaluing of EU citizenship. So one of the things that I had argued was that EU citizenship functions as an immigration category and in so doing it really reduces the sort of symbolic heft of citizenship because it doesn't deliver very much. Now I'd love to say that the Brexit uh, result stands as sort of a, a proof point on that claim, but I haven't done the work up to today that would really support that, but I'm curious about whether maybe it could. Um, and most interesting, if completely unforeseen, is the idea that Brexit itself gives us an example of the tensions and trade-offs between economics and human rights. That the human rights pressures that come with migration advocacy are what are being resisted initially by the British public and now through the negotiation process by the British government. But the economic 
benefits of an open border are really what the British government in its divorce negotiations is seeking to retain. Um, just, the, just the trade bits, not thinking about economics very narrowly as a, as a trade output. So, um, so Brexit really completely surprised me, and yet it is all about immigration politics. Um, and then I want to uh, just stay with Europe for a moment to talk about uh, three and a half examples. And I, I did have an opportunity to come back to this example a little bit in the book because um, the book actually began being printed in November, late November of 2015. And so by late November of 2015, uh, the German government had opened its border to about a million um, people Let's just call them people. Let's try to keep some label off of them for the moment. But about a million people seeking to remain in Europe, coming from at least a, a critical mass from Syria and from other places in, in the Middle East. And I have to say that the German response in 2015 and the persistence of Angela Merkel's response really surprised me. And that there's some really interesting optimism there. And that I think that that optimism does relate to a story that is um, not so much about human rights, but a story that is about thinking in that human rights phrase more about the human than about the rights. Because you, Rights are fairly narrow, and as many other uh, nations of the EU have shown, you can whittle them down to a tiny, tiny little point. But if you work hard to keep the whole human part of human rights in the frame, you, you may possibly come up with a slightly, different, uh, a slightly different current here. So I wrote in the preface of the book, because it was still November of 2015, about seeing some optimism and some possibility of stepping outside the dominant trends in the position that Angela Merkel took at that time. And I think that um, uh, I think that that her commitment to a different kind of immigration politics, first of all, is causing her enormous problems. Clearly it demonstrates that um, whatever else immigration politics is now, they are absolutely central to national state politics. I mean, there, there was a time um, within my grown-up life, like it's not some ancient historic time, it may be 20 years ago, but it's not 50 years ago, where all of these Western liberal democracies probably had a minister for immigration who was a junior minister, who might have been a minister for immigration and labor or immigration and employment, and it just was not a central preoccupation. Um, even Philip Ruddock, when he first became Minister of Immigration in Australia, was in a junior role, and as immigration politics heated up, he, be he became promoted with his role, just as Jason Kenney did here in Canada. Um, when when uh, immigration became more important, so did he. I think this is true of Ruddock, at least for a while. Um, so Angela Merkel has done something really interesting, and uh, it may yet cost her her government. I didn't look at this morning's paper, but... Uh, I'm always expecting uh, new news on that front. In any case, um, I think that uh, that if we think about e events in Europe since um, since the time that the book went to press, there really are some significant challenges um, that that do fit into the theme of immigration having a different kind of political salience, but that have surprised me in particular ways. All right. So the next thing that I I do not want to talk about, but that I feel compelled to say something about. I was just going to say I want to talk about it, but it's not true that I want to talk about Donald Trump's regime, but rather that one is compelled uh, in this lens to say something uh, about the direction that Donald Trump has been pushing immigration politics in the United States. And the theme that I want to think about in talking briefly about Donald Trump is the theme of legalization. So, as late as 1987, or as early as 1987, and in the 1980s into the early 1990s, we would have said about the United States, Canada, Australia, um, that all of these countries were, had immigration regulation which was characterized by almost unbridled executive um, discretion. 
And what's really interesting uh, about what has happened in the United States with Donald Trump's, first of all, very strong and aggressive moves on an immigration front. Secondly, um, bringing immigration absolutely to the center of the political stage. Uh, but thirdly, that his actions have been highly legalized in a way that three decades ago would have been unnecessary. Um, and that the idea that you can challenge, for example, the um, travel ban directed against citizens of Muslim-majority countries, um, that you can challenge that in the courts and actually win, not ultimately, not completely prevail, but that you can have some significant wins there and that you can use the courts to get concessions. And that that is that the courts are a central part of immigration politics. Did it used to be true? Okay. And now it's just we expect that over and over and over again. When I started teaching Canadian immigration law, which was returning to Canada in 2002, so again, a while ago, but not like a million years ago, there were five cases from the Supreme Court of Canada on immigration full stop ever. Okay? There have been that many cases this year. So this legalization trend is part of what we see um, with what Donald Trump has been doing. And even uh, in the recent debacle of, of separating children from their parents at the border, the, the core of that policy decision is a ruling by the courts that children cannot be detained. So the Trump administration takes that ruling and says, all right then, we're gonna, we are going to exercise our legal authority and the United States, like Australia, has a mandatory detention regime, regime for unauthorized border crossers, whether or not they enter the asylum system. The reason this regime gets much more attention in Australia than in the United States is because Australia has um, enough places to lock people up for the number of people who actually can cross that border without authorization. So Australia has a geographic advantage, teeny tiny numbers. There's lots of prisons in the United States. It's not as though there is, in general, a shortage of lockup in the US, but there's no possible way to lock up all unauthorized migrants. So it's kind of a, a policy failure situation in comparison with Australia. But in any case, the debacle of separated children owes its, uh, owes its origins and its sort of correct core, and in part, um, uh, Donald Trump's repeated assertions that this is democratic policy, to court rulings that children ought not to be detained. And consequently, if you're going to detain their parents, you need to separate them. So we have a similar um, story in Canada about children in detention, and in the past year there have been about 300 or so, um, and that is that those children are not really detained. They are just, their parents are just choosing to have them in jail with them. Um, and so uh, I think that might be like a, a triumph of rhetoric. They're not really detained, they're just locked up somewhere, but they, that is a choice that their parents are making, not the state. Um, and that sometimes in Canada, children are separated and put in foster care, not in, not in things that look like detention centers, but in, in foster care arrangements in Canada is how we have generally coped with a similar dilemma. And then, of course, um, uh, the law hasn't been quite so hard in Canada, so sometimes children are detained. So I guess um, uh, I don't want to spend too much time thinking, troubling the question of Donald Trump aside uh, from saying that immigration politics in the United States are definitely central to the political agenda. They've been there before, um, but they are uh, taking on completely new dimensions. I think it's also um, apparent that this is not a particularly partisan position. So that Donald Trump's um, approach to immigration is by and away, it finds a fair bit of sympathy with some members of the Republican Party. But there are lots of Republicans, you can read about it in the newspapers regularly, who are not on side with this. So this is not an ordinary um, cyclical swing back and forth to say, oh, well, now we have a Republican regime, so what did you expect? This is something that is um, out of the ordinary, uh, a little bit... Um, uh, well, no. Let's hope that it's a lot exceptional, but I'm not 
as the Trump administration continues, I, along with others, are less optimistic that this is, you know, a quick blip that will be over. Well, certainly he'll be impeached sometime soon, or at the very least, this is only four years. I'm just not so sure. Um, and maybe Matt will um, tell us what the opinion data says about that uh, when we get to, to the question period. Um, I told a few people earlier today, I gave a talk about immigration law, because that's really just my one trick. Every talk I give is about immigration law, uh, in a small college in Washington state, but not on the coast, up in the interior early in 2016, but after the presidential inauguration. And my hosts who had invited me felt a need to warn me that in the preceding two months, the Ku Klux Klan had become active on their campus, and that there was a reasonable chance that Klansmen would, um, would come and protest my talk. And so I thought that that was, I mean, that's just a marker of, of a kind of immigration politics. We remember the original stories of the Ku Klux Klan that wasn't so immigration oriented. Racist, yes. Immigration, not so much. So uh, there's something going on there which points to a different kind of politics, which many of us are hoping is a temporary blip, but which I think there are some reasons to think that we won't quite return to the status quo ante. And that really brings me to the third example that I want to talk about, which is our local example. Um, and uh, the election of the Justin Trudeau government in Canada and the way that the Justin Trudeau government has approached immigration matters. And here the theme that I want to draw on is the idea that the, the contemporary politics of immigration is not explained by partisan considerations. So this is a government that is, well, we're so desperate for a left of center government in this country that we often call this government a left of center government. But it is at least a center government, and it is at least left of the Harper government that uh, that was in charge of Canadian immigration law for a decade, for the, the decade prior to uh, Trudeau being elected. So one of the things that happened between 2006 and 2015 under Harper's conservative government is that in both high-profile ways and subtle ways, almost every aspect of Canadian immigration law and policy was altered. <coughs> Family immigration was changed. Economic immigration was changed. The refugee system was completely, completely changed. Refugee resettlement was actually not changed because it's not a legal system, and, but approaches to it were changed. So the law really changed. And it is clear that the Trudeau government has done some things differently and was elected talking about um, uh, a massive commitment to refugee resettlement, which they worked on uh, fulfilling the promise of and did, did uh, like quite astonishing refugee resettlement by the end of 2015, but not so much in 2016, 2017, or 2018. We're sort of back much more to where we were before. So there are a few things um, that have changed with the Justin Trudeau government. Citizenship stripping has changed. Refugee resettlement numbers in that first year. Health inadmissibility has changed. Health care rights have been returned to refugee claimants. On the other hand, there are some things that really haven't changed. The Faster Removal of Foreign Criminals Act not changed. The Balanced Refugee Reform Act untouched. The Safe Third Country Agreement, which was never a Harper um, initiative to begin with, but with deteriorating conditions in the United States, you would think that it would change untouched. Express entry, not touched. And sharp limits on passing on citizenship, unchanged. So how do we sort these two groups? What have they bothered to change, and what have they not bothered to change? I think it's revealing in a way that I'm really reluctant to um, admit, because I think it suggests that we are not going to get back to the status quo ante, that there's no way that we can go back to where we were at in 2005. So the citizenship stripping provisions, let's look at them one by one. Yeah, I'll tax you for a few more minutes on this. The citizenship stripping provisions. Canada had enacted, uh, right at the end of the Harper regime, a very high profile law that said people could be stripped of Canadian citizenship for involvement in certain terrorist-like activities. 
And the UK has a provision like this, a few other countries. The UK has had it for about a decade, has used it 27 times. The law was never used in Canada. But it had a lot of symbolic heft, and symbolism matters a great deal in citizenship law. So we repealed that law. We may never have used it. We may never have been planning on using it, but it is gone. Thank goodness it's no longer there. Getting rid of it, definitely a good thing. Refugee resettlement numbers were really ramped up in 2015, but since 2015, the ramp up has not continued, even though, the, even though globally, the number of people who might possibly need refugee resettlement has increased. Um, and it doesn't look like we're not doing anything um, regulation-wise to increase the commitment to refugee resettlement. It is still an optional step that a government can take any time it wants to. And I had worked with a, a group of NGOs on um, consulting with the Canadian government prior to the um, conversations in the fall of 2016 about a new global compact for refugees. And this was a moment where Canada really could have come out and advocated strongly for um, meaningful global commitments to resettlement. And the government, even in private conversations, even as trial balloons that you might want to talk about that you could possibly float internationally, said, no, no, that is something that we just don't want to put on our advocacy plate. Um, restoring refugee health care rights. So this is a big rhetorical win, and there have been a lot of advocacy about, the, about removing um, refugee claimants, not people with refugee status, but people who were claiming refugee status in Canada. Removing um, those people from health care protection was something that the Harper government had, uh, had done. Um, and that the Trudeau government reversed. So that's an important and meaningful reversal. But the interesting thing about this reversal is that the data that had been accumulating prior to the reversal was that um, the cost of not providing health care on a regular basis and instead providing health care on an emergency basis was astronomical. And that it was far outstripping the course of just the cost of just allowing people to get ordinary health care in the first place. So much so that by the time the Trudeau government made this reversal, um, most provincial governments had stepped into the gap already. So that's the refugee um, health rights story. And then I think the more, the probably of all of these things, the most far-reaching change was actually changing provisions in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act about health inadmissibility. Health inadmissibility is a, are a series of provisions in the law that say that people who have health conditions that are likely to cost more than the average Canadian health care costs are inadmissible to the country. And the government has really tempered down that rule. And it is significant, but it is also an area where a lot of time and bureaucracy have been spent in the years between the introduction of the provision in its current form in 2002 and its removal in 2017. A huge number of people had actually been exempted from that law. So it follows an earlier pattern of um, being able to say that, that when there's a lot of exceptionalism, sometimes legal change follows. So all those things were changed, and they're all, they all make for good headlines, and they all are good changes that immigrant advocates would support, but they really pale in comparison that the things that the Trudeau government has not changed and isn't signaling that it's likely to change. So one of those things is the sharp limits on passing on citizenship. So second generation citizenship for people born outside of the country was removed in 2009, and there's no sense that that's coming back. One of the things this might mean for me, and this is an example uh, that, that is a wake up and uh, listen example, because one of the things for me, it means that if my children follow my life pattern, my grandchildren will only be Australian. So when you find a pocket in the law where the Australian law is more generous than the Canadian law, you really have to sit up and go, what? What is that? That's a thing, right? And um, there's no sense. It's true. Somebody said this this morning that we're not very far removed. Many um, European inheritance Canadians are not very far removed from an immigration story. So my parents were born in this country and all my grandparents were born in this country country and three of my great grandparents were born in this country so I've been I have as much Canadian heritage as most people but my grandchildren will be Australian 
And I'm glad that they will have some citizenship. Even my daughter, who was born stateless in Australia, um, uh, may well have uh, children who are only Australian and be limited in her capacity to pass on her Canadian citizenship. That's a change that the Trudeau government is not talking about going back on. And it doesn't only affect me. It affects tens of thousands of Canadians and their children. Citizenshiping, citizenship stripping, highly symbolic, affecting almost no one. Removal of um, this right to pass on citizenship is going to affect many, many, many people. Um, and then we have express entry. So express entry is, is uh, like a, a secondary um, point system on top of a primary point system, which has the effect of pressing restart every six months or so and, uh, and bubbling up the whole system so that it's hard to say that the system functions at all the way it did before. Like nobody has dismantled the underlying point system, but we have completely changed the way it actually delivers results. Nobody's talking about potentially dismantling that. That affects you know, hundreds of thousands of people, not the tens of thousands of people affected by citizenship stripping. The Balanced Refugee Reform Act, which completely changes the way um, refugee protection is managed in this country and introduces um, safe countries of origin, a, a pernicious import if ever there was one. No talk at all of changing that system. The Faster Removal of Foreign Criminals Act, which dramatically increases deportability from Canada by lowering the threshold at which criminal convictions lead to deportability. Not a word, not a word, despite the name of it, Faster Removal of Foreign Criminals Act. No talk at all about changing that. So that also affects tens of thousands of people. So I think the story about what has happened under the Trudeau government is really a story about, yes, some things have been changed, but they're the easy things. They are the low-hanging fruit. They are the symbolic wins. And that the overall architecture, which limits what family immigration is and limits the size of the class, which completely reorders how our economic immigration works, which moves the, the move towards more temporary than permanent migrants. If you run the graph from the Harper to the Trudeau years, it just goes straight up like this. There's a little blip with economic downturn, but there's no blips with change in government. And that it really is this government, which is very immigrant friendly, very immigrant friendly, just read the tweets. The immigrant-friendly government is not going to roll back the profound change in Canadian immigration law that has really been solidified with the previous 10 years, but which was certainly in train in the years before that. And the Safe Third Country Agreement is a very good example. There, it would be the smartest thing in the world to tear up the agreement and the legal basis for doing so, i.e. the idea that the United States is not as safe for people seeking refugee protection as it once was, is pretty much sitting out there on a platter. And the sole and only reason that we have people walking across Canada's land borders in unpredictable ways is the safe third country agreement. That is the only reason, the absolute only reason. Donald Trump didn't cross those people cause those people to walk across the border, the fact that, the, that walking across in an unorganized way gives you an exception to the safe third country agreement is why people are doing it. So, and I would finally say that even the Trudeau government's uh, funding of, um, in, under their Ministry of Multiculturalism, funding anti-racism initiatives is, a, is like anti-racism initiatives are a very good thing. But they're really not a multiculturalism commitment. And in fact, they stand, the idea that that's your major multiculturalism initiative is very homogenizing and very uh, reductive of what multiculturalism used to engage with in Canada. So I think, um, if anything, the, the shift to the Trudeau government is, of all of these shifts, the ones that is sadly um, most confirmatory of the arguments that I was pursuing in the book, and that's probably because I was sitting in Canada for most of the time that I was writing the book, so maybe I had a better odds of getting things right uh, closer to home. All right, so all of these examples show a politics that is resolutely central to all Western liberal democracies at this point. A politics marked by mean-spiritedness in very large measure, 
don't get me started on recent changes to Australia asylum, um, a pol and a lack of policy creativity, a commitment to finding that contemporary migrants do not measure up to their predecessors, and a real ineffectiveness of a whole range of human rights arguments. And in the backdrop, more and more evidence that people all around the world both want and need to find new places to live, and sometimes want new places to live because they need them. And the, the way in which the law, uh, this is, um, uh, we spent some time talking today in response to Rebecca's excellent paper about the law and categorization. This is just how the law is. This, this binary, the law builds binaries, is such a blunt instrument. Right? Law just does it. Yes, no, yeah, guilty, not guilty, citizen, non-citizen. So, so um, the law is replicating these categories. Um, and people who want or need to move will work in whatever ways they can to look like they conform to whatever categories are being imposed. And that's the, the nature of creating a, a real pent-up um, globally, globally very broad-based desire for people to live in different places. So the three new examples I touched on this afternoon are all things, um, not quite Trudeau, but certainly two and a half of them are things I wouldn't have um, predicted, but the immigration politics that have accompanied them are, if anything, um, more dire also than I was thinking back in 2015. And I was, I have to say, at that point, because I was writing that preface watching what Angela Merkel was doing, and the Trudeau government had just been elected literally about two days before my deadline for sending that off. And I was way more optimistic about that government than I am now. But where now do I find some possibilities for optimism? So first of all, um, I think, I, I continue to think that the single most important thing to do is to persist in working to narrate migration in ways that are not simply um, calling on discourses of economics or human rights. That both of those discourses are reductive in particular ways. And that it's important that we think about value in ways that, is, that are not only economic value. And important that if we are going to insist on talking about human rights, that we really focus on the human part. Um, I think if we focus more on human and less on rights, that those moments where political discourses as a whole make that kind of shift are really the moments where we see unpredictable things. I think that's what we see in Angela Merkel's decisions at the end of 2015. I think that's what we see in the Trump reversal. Even when it's clumsily expressed, uh, as I forget which, which tweet, um, from that account it was, but even when you're thinking nobody wants to see that happen to those kids, you are somehow focusing not on a right, there's absolutely no concession that people have a right not to be separated from their children, but rather that this is not a human way to behave. Um, I also think that, and this is something that I didn't choose an example about so I won't spend much time on it, that, um, that we have gotten to a point where we we have so criminalized immigration, and Juliet Strump calls, it, calls this crimigration, that we have actually passed the tipping point, and we're now into the realm of criminal law. And you know, criminal law has actually really strong protections for accused, and a really strong tradition. Things like, you would never imagine this as an immigration lawyer, a presumption of innocence, just as a start. I'm sure you've heard of it, it's on television every night. Um, <laughs> Importing a presumption of innocence into many immigration law settings actually brings an enormous amount of potential. And although for many, many, many years people like me resisted crimigration, of course that was kind of futile. And uh, now there's so much criminal law, so much criminal law content in immigration law provisions that positive things are actually happening. And then I really think it's impossible, it's important to continue to advocate for things that are completely and 100% out of the box. So not just to advocate at the margins, not just to say, could you please not lock up children for more than 14 days, or could you please, please just send children to foster homes instead, but really to go for the 100% out of the box things, if only to keep the discursive space broader. And this is one of the things that really happens a lot to people like me, to immigration lawyers. 
So we spend so much time fighting at the margins that we forget the really big fights. So I just want to say two of these things. One is I think there should be a global requirement for refugee resettlement. If we doubled the number of people resettled in the world in 2015 and continued at that rate of resettlement, which would mean moving from about 120,000 to 240,000, and continued at that rate, would take about 50 years to resettle everybody currently needing resettlement. But of course it wouldn't because so many people would die before then. Right? So we could talk and talk and talk and talk about refugee resettlement, but we are doing so little now that it's almost invisible. So let's ramp it up and let's create some sort of global imperative for it and let's not make it minuscule. Like it's great that the Trudeau government took 15,000 more people in 2015 than they were planning on, but where are the 50,000 more, the 200,000 more, the million more? Right. Um, and then the other thing is I really think that the world needs an asylum visa. And there have been some experiments in Switzerland, but I think we should go there. But what's very interesting about advocacy is we generally don't say the way out there ideas. And if nothing else, Donald Trump has at least opened the playing field for ideas that are way beyond the margins of what we once thought were possible. So let's populate those margins with ideas that, are, that sound a little bit crazy, but not crazy bad. All right, I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take questions.